Did you know that in the 17th century, the Polish Commonwealth of the Kingdom of Poland and Grand Duchy of Lithuania was one of the most powerful countries in Europe. Now we hear of the Tudors in England and the French kings Louis from 1 to 14, but we almost never hear the story from Eastern Europe. And in the 17th century, the Crown of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania came together. They created a federated state, the first federated state in Europe, and established what was one of the biggest countries. At its peak, it comprised of 400,000 square miles with some 11 million inhabitants. 11 million in 17th century was a huge number. It was a country that in the north touched the Baltic Sea and went all the way south to Black Sea. It was multi-ethnic and multi-faith country inhabited by Poles, Russians, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, Germans, Jews, by Catholics, Protestants, Eastern Orthodox, and Muslims. It was a prosperous country with a king that was elected. Our kings were not inherited from father to son and so on, but our kings were elected. And so it was an unusual and yet powerful country. And then suddenly, in 1795, it ceased to exist. Three of our neighbors, Russia, Prussia, and Austria conquered Poland and partitioned Poland between among themselves. A part of Poland was occupied by the Tsarist Russia, the southern part by Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the west by Prussia. For next 123 years, all the way until the end of World War I, 1918. For 123 years, people were born and died without having their own country. People lived <coughs> under brutal occupants who tried to erase Polish identity, Polish culture, the sense of Polishness as such. And yet, even though they lived without knowing whether Poland will be reborn again, even though they lived without knowing if things will get better ever again, they did the right thing. They cultivated Polish language, Polish identity and culture. They did the right thing without knowing if it ever gets better again. Why do I speak about Poland today? Not because I'm Polish patriot, which I am. Not only because I want to know Polish history, but also because many times Polish history is compared to the story of Job from the Bible. And before we move to Job, let me say first that most, if not all, Bible scholars today agree that the book of Job is not a history 
It's a story. It doesn't tell us of factual events that really happened. It's a metaphor. It's a story of meditation that ponders ethical and religious questions. So it's not right to take the story literally. Instead, we have to seek a deeper meaning in it. I remember my seminary professor used to tell us that we, as Catholics, take Bible too seriously to take it literally. If you take Bible seriously, it's almost impossible to take it literally because we cherish the Bible so much, because it is so important for us. It would do us disservice to take it literally. And so, knowing that it is a story, a metaphor, in this story, Satan, who strangely enough was a part of God's courthouse, came to God and said, There is Job, and he's pious, he's just, he's righteous, he prays every day. He does all the good things, but he does them because you have blessed him with riches, with a loving wife, with many children, and if he didn't have any of those things, he would have stopped being a good man. Wanna bet? <laughs> so Satan and God enter into this strange wager. And in an instant, Job loses all his savings, riches, and wealth. All his children die. And he finds himself sick with leprosy. In the first reading we just heard, we meet Job broke, sick, and yet faithful to God. Sitting in a pile of manure, not to use the other word, <laughs> and asking the questions that we all ask ourselves as well. Now his three best friends came by and they tried awkwardly to help him, but they made things even worse. They asked Job, what have you done that God is punishing you? You must have done something. It must be karma coming back to you. Otherwise, it would make no sense whatsoever. And Job sits quietly with his friends in a way that is surprising and uncharacteristic to fairy tales. Job does not come with any simplistic answers. Job doesn't have a simple answer to difficult questions. He doesn't invent platitudes that would mean nothing. Instead, he faces the reality, and in today's reading he says, the night, the darkness drags on. I don't know if the dawn will ever come. The questions that Job asked, all of us ask as well, when something terrible happens. Why am I sick? Is God punishing me? 
Why did I lose all my savings? Why am I unemployed? Why did my child die? And yet, like Job, we live, if we are intellectually honest with ourselves, without simple answers. Sure, someone can send us a beautiful Hallmark card with another platitude, and it's nice and pleasant of them. But at the end of the day, it doesn't take the pain away. At the end of the day, if we are intellectually honest with Job, we have to say, the night drags on. I may never see dawn again. And yet, like Job, we too can remain faithful to God in such dark moments, in such dark nights of the soul. As a hospice chaplain, I encounter Job's, Job's questions every day. And like Job, I too cannot offer simple answers. Why is my mother, who never smoked a single cigarette in her lifetime, dying of a lung cancer? What sense does it make that after coming to this country with my children to give them a better, safer life, now I see my son or daughter die before me. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why does a good God allow evil to exist? We all sooner or later encounter Job's questions. I think the most famous quote from the book of Job in English, taken from King of James, the Bible of King James, is God giveth, God taketh away. I prefer today's quote, the night drives on. On the pages of the Gospel, including today's passage, we encounter Jesus healing many people. And yet nobody ever tells us that these people, miraculously healed by Jesus, end up dying anyway. Even Lazarus died again. Even Jesus, God's beloved Son, God incarnate, suffers and dies. So, with Job and with Jesus, we face the same question. But with Jesus, with his suffering and death, we arrive at the point of resurrection. For Good Friday was not and is not the end of Jesus' story. Unlike Job, Jesus knows that dawn does come. Sunday morning will arrive. The dawn of new life will be ours. 
the hope. We ask Job's questions day in and day out. Let us journey together towards Jesus' answers. Amen. Amen. Amen.